region of Las Cañadas in Tenerife. Visited in mid-1973 by British astronomers and scientists on a direct line to the sun. It began in June when the party Mostly members of the British Astronomical Association boarded Asnar Line's flagship, Monte Ombe, at Liverpool. The principal destination was a point at sea off the coast of Mauritania in West Africa to observe one of the most important solar eclipses of the century, one of the rarest and most awe-inspiring spectacles ever seen on Earth, which will be unequaled until the year 2150. Amongst the many eminent astronomers on the ship, was the British Astronomical Association's Director of Artificial Satellites and Transient Astronomical Phenomena Sections who had been closely concerned arrangements for the voyage, Howard Miles. Also in the party was the Director of the BAA Moon Section, Television Personality Patrick Moore. Monte Umbe sailed from Liverpool on June 22nd at 6pm. At 8,900 tonnes, she was reckoned as being ideal for getting into the shallow waters comparatively uncharted off the West African coast. Her full complement of 312 passengers justifiably felt they were embarking on a very real 20th century voyage of discovery. saw most passengers relaxing, enjoying the mild sunshine. Many of them had travelled considerable distances to join the ship, not only from all parts of Britain, but from Europe, and even in two instances from the United States of America. All with a common interest. Some hardy types took an early opportunity of trying one of the ship's two swimming pools. The majority, however, were content to take it easy, saving their energy for attacking the buffet lunch. Many people wanted to know why the BAA Council had decided on this type of excursion. How this is a, a culmination of months and months of hard work for you in deciding where we were going to see the eclipse. But tell me one thing, why did you choose a ship? Well, it, it, was, I mean, it was the result of these investigations. It showed that for a large party, this was the only area in which we could, could go. You see, we studied the whole of the eclipse length for three main considerations, accessibility, cost and weather conditions. Take for example in Mauritania, the uh, virtually free of cloud but you've got an average minimum temperature of 107 degrees and then there is the difficulty of getting in there because the Mauritanian government have put on some very restrictive um, procedures which are unnecessary for traveling in Sahara in the summer months. Well what about the other side of Africa, the east side? Go over to Kenya on the other side there's a risk of very high risk of cloud, except for around Lake Rudolph. But um, the cost will be two or three times what it would be on the case of the boat. And after all, um, cost is an important, uh, important aspect of the thing. And this left virtually just nothing else but the ship. 
but we are picking a point which is relatively near to the coast and according to the statistics that have been published it is in an area where the sea will be relatively calm. But the trouble is, Peter, is this area is relatively um, unexplored and it's with a very, very small amount of detail. I mean, there are four maps available to the area, the American, Spanish, French and the Admiralty, and they all give different information about this position. So we're going to have a bit of a difficulty in getting to the point we would like. Well, it, it sounds to me as if it's uh, quite an expedition then. Well, we hope will we get there and will we see the eclipse? Well, if we get there and it's clear, we'll see the eclipse. The passing your list included a varied cross-section of people with a common interest, but with differing reasons for their enthusiasm. One attitude is typified by experienced eclipse observer John Cope. I never considered consider myself to be an astronomer. I'm really a, just a, a chaser of eclipses. I, I pursue the shadow of the moon to all the distant places of the Earth. It's a complicated business because, unfortunately, it always seems to strike the Earth at places which are completely inaccessible. Hence this magnificent ship, which has been chartered specially to, to place us in exactly on the central line of this very long eclipse, the longest eclipse left in this century. Well, I've never seen a total eclipse. I've seen quite a number of partial eclipses and photographed them. And this is one reason why I've come on this trip, because I really wanted to see one of these uh, rather rare phenomena and I wanted to see it at least while I was still alive and active enough to see it. Well I'm on this trip because uh, as part of my professional or full-time job I'm director of the London Schools Planetarium and the London Schools Planetarium open to all schools we're teaching children we're teaching teachers we're teaching student teachers the elementary astronomy and to come on a trip like this where I can take film of an actual eclipse myself makes it far better from the teaching point of view I can show the film I can talk about it the experience behind it and as you know when you've experienced something yourself you can put it across much better oh I'm only here for the ride in fact there seem to be quite a few people only here for the ride there was still an appreciable amount of relaxation. Almost the atmosphere of a normal cruise, with advantage being taken of the ship's recreational facilities. But of course, there was a much more serious intention. Some of this was indicated by one of the most highly qualified scientists on board, senior lecturer in physics at Keele University, Dr. Ron Madison. One of the things we're getting increasingly alarmed about in these last few years is the energy crisis. And it appears that the world's resources of fossilized fuels are rapidly running out. And I think this is one of the justifications for the study of the sun. We see a large number of people gathered around us here which are uh, endeavoring to get some valuable measurements of the pearly atmosphere surrounding the sun. What will this tell us? I think it's going to tell us a lot about the structure inside the Sun which is going to lead to a knowledge of how we can tame the thermonuclear processes eventually so that we'll be able to solve our own energy crisis. It seems that there are other ways of using the Sun's energy. Of course we can collect it directly, convert it directly into electrical power and this is being done on quite a large scale in some sunny parts of the world. But of course not every country has such sunny skies and what we have to do is try to duplicate the activity of the sun by trying to copy the thermonuclear processes that it itself is using in its interior so the astronomer is the sun the sun is nothing more than a typical ordinary star and by studying the sun we're looking at all the other stars together we're looking at a possible source of unlimited power for the whole of mankind for those wanting to get down to business Daily morning lectures were given in the ship's cinema on a wide range of astronomical subjects by various eminent speakers. BAA Vice President Gordon Taylor introduced the first session and lecturer Patrick Moore. The lectures proved so popular that the cinema was quickly packed to capacity and each lecture had to be repeated to a second audience. I don't know the difference between an asteroid and an adenoid. 
and this merely is an introduction to what comes later. And after all, I'm not really a fun man, and looking round, I have an inferiority complex straight away, because I see such a distinguished galaxy around me. Uh, I look round to my right, I see Horace Dahl, probably the greatest optical expert in the world. I look ahead, I see Gordon Taylor, most distinguished professional astronomer. I look somewhere else and I see Howard Miles, who's also a very distinguished astronomer, even though he does have some rather odd idea about moon craters. Uh, and so on and so on. So in fact, this is merely going to be a very basic introductory talk. And um, it was advertised as being right back to square one. And so I'm going to go right back to square one. And I'm going to address myself to people here who literally don't know anything about astronomy at all. And uh, could I please have a genuine show of hands for those who really don't know very much about astronomy? <laughs> there are some, and therefore, uh, anyone who does know anything at all has been warned. This is going to be basic, and so anyone who doesn't want to hear the extremely elementary facts of life had better go up and go out now, and I shan't be at all offended if they do. You can occasionally see total eclipses from England. The last one was in 1927. The next one's going to be on August the 11th, 1999. And so, if you go down to Cornwall on that date, you will see a very old man with a long beard and a bath chair, and that'll be me. But until then, I'm afraid if you stay in England, you won't see a total eclipse. Now, the reason for this is quite simple. I have said that the moon just is big enough to get in front of the sun and blot out the sun's disk. This is true. And the operative word is just. Enthusiasm went beyond the formal lecture program, and small groups regularly gathered in less formal surroundings. Because we're going to see a lot of bright stars in the vicinity of the sun. Now, as far as um, we're concerned, this time from the ship, the sun will be at an azimuth of 70 degrees, 77 degrees, which is approximately east-northeast. And it'll be at an angle of 55 degrees from the horizon. That means to say, not far off what the sun is at the present time, quite high off. I'm wondering whether, during the period of totality, whether in addition to the various planets we can expect to see, there's a reasonable probability that there may be a comet to be observed. That's a very interesting question. In 1948, in the eclipse that was visible from Kenya, they saw a comet which they didn't know was in the vicinity. So with this eclipse, we, do, we don't know of any comet in the area. There may be one, and it'll be interesting to, to look out for one. Whether we see one or not, we don't know. It's one of these mysteries. Thank you. The ship's navigation, regular charting of its course and position, was a subject of one of the exercises being carried out by certain members of the party. At this stage, enthusiasm, satisfaction and a high degree of optimism were all much in evidence. Well, here we are, steaming briskly towards the line of totality. And so far as we can tell at the moment, everything is going well. This, of course, is going to be a particularly favourable eclipse for several reasons. First, the moon is almost at its closest to us. And secondly, the sun is almost at its furthest away. So the moon appears considerably larger than the sun, and where we are going to be, it's going to cover the sun for a grand total of more than six minutes, which is a pretty good. Also, where we're going to be, off the African coast, I think we can practically guarantee good weather. Uh, we should be desperately unlucky if we don't get it. We're not going to get quite the maximum length of totality. You'll get that over seven minutes just inside Mauritania, but I think this is more than compensated for by the fact that we do expect the conditions to be really good. The only thing that worries some of us just a bit is the possible rolling motion of the boat during totality, and that's the thing we've just got to live with. And so, at the moment, it seems to me that everything is set fair, and we really will see the eclipse of the century. The effect of the ship